Good morning. Welcome to English Mirror. Today, we analyze the essay Modernity and Incomplete Project by Yuga Habermas. Yuga Habermas was born in 1929 in Germany. He is not only a social theorist but also a strong defender of modernity. The assaults made by postmodernists on modernists are very strongly countered by Habermas. Let's look at the essay. Habermas continues to insist on the utopian potential of modernity in a social context in which faith in the enlightenment project of a good society promoted by reason sees a fading hope and spurned idol Habermas remains one of its strongest defender modernity is a child of enlightenment it is anchored in reason and democracy and therefore habermas sees modernity as an unfinished project it means that much more has to be done in the realm of modernity before thinking about the possibility of a postmodern world he starts with the subheading the ancients and the moderns the term modern has a long history one which has been investigated by hans robert ross the word modern in its latin form Modernus was used for the first time in the late 5th century in order to distinguish the present which had become officially Christian from the Roman and pagan past. Some writers restrict this concept of modernity to the Renaissance, but this is historically too narrow. People considered themselves modern during the period of Charles the Great in the 12th century as well as in France of the late 17th century. The term modern appeared and reappeared exactly during those periods in Europe when the consciousness of a new epoch formed itself through a renewed relationship to the ancients whenever moreover antiquity was considered a model to be recovered through some kind of imitation the spell which the classics of the ancient world cast upon the spirit of later times was first dissolved with the ideals of the french enlightenment specifically the idea of being modern by looking back to the ancient changed with a belief inspired by modern science in the infinite progress of knowledge and in the infinite advance towards social and moral betterment another form of modernist consciousness was formed in the wake of this change the romantic modern is sought to oppose the antique ideals of the classicists he looked for a new historical epoch and found it in the idealized middle ages however this new ideal age established early in the 19th century did not remain a fixed ideal in the course of the 19th century there emerged out of this romantic spirit that radicalized consciousness of modernity which freed itself from all specific historical ties this most recent modernism simply makes an abstract opposition between tradition and the present and we are in a way still the contemporaries of that kind of aesthetic modernity which first appeared in the midst of the 19th century since then the distinguishing mark of works which count as modern is the new which will be overcome and made obsolete through the novelty of the next style but while that which is merely stylish will soon become outmoded that which is modern preserves a secret tie to the classical a modern work becomes a classic because it has once been authentically modern the relation between modern and classical has definitely lost a fixed historical reference the discipline of aesthetic modernity the spirit and discipline of aesthetic modernity assumed clear contours in the work of baudelaire modernity then unfolded in various avant-garde moments and finally reached its climax in the cafe voltaire of the dadaist and in surrealism 
Aesthetic modernity is characterized by attitudes which find a common focus in a changed consciousness of time. This time consciousness expresses itself through metaphors of the vanguard and the avant-garde. The avant-garde understands itself as invading unknown territory, exposing itself to the dangers of sudden, shocking encounters, conquering an as yet unoccupied future. The avant-garde must find a direction in a landscape into which no one seems to have yet ventured. The new time consciousness, which enters philosophy in the writings of Bergson, does more than express the experience of mobility in society, of acceleration in history, of discontinuity in everyday life. Modernity revolts against the normalizing functions of tradition. Modernity lives on the experience of rebelling against all that is normative. This revolt is one way to neutralize the standards of both morality and utility. The time consciousness articulated in avant-garde art is not simply a historical. It is directed against what might be called a false normativity in history. The modern avant-garde spirit has sought to use the past in a different way. It disposes those pasts which have been made available by the objectifying scholarship of historicism, but it opposes at the same time a neutralized history which is locked up in the museum of historicism. Now, the spirit of aesthetic modernity has recently begun to age. It has been recited once more in the 1960s. After the 1970s, however, we must admit to ourselves that this modernism arouses a much fainter response today than it did 15 years ago. Octavio Paz, a fellow traveler of modernity, noted already in the middle of the 1960s that the avant-garde of 1960... What is the meaning of this failure? Does it signal a farewell to modernity? Thinking more generally, does the existence of a post-avant-garde mean there is a transition to that broader phenomenon called postmodernity? This is, in fact, how Daniel Bell, the most brilliant of the American neoconservatives, interprets matters. In his book, The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, Bell argues that the crisis of the developed societies of the West are to be traced back to a split between culture and society. Modernist culture has come to penetrate the values of everyday life. The life world is infected by modernism. Because of the forces of modernism, the principle of unlimited self-realization, the demand for authentic self-experience, and the subjectivism of a hyper-stimulated sensitivity have come to be dominant. Culture, in its modern form, stirs up hatred against the conventions and virtues of everyday life. But now, modernism is dominant, but dead. Cultural modernity and societal modernization. Cultural modernity generates its own aporias as well. Independently from the consequences of societal modernization and within the perspective of cultural development itself, there originate motives for doubting the project of modernity. Discussion of modernity and its discontents into a different domain that touches on these aporias of cultural modernity. The project of enlightenment. The idea of modernity is intimately tied to the development of European art. But what I call the project of modernity comes only into focus when we dispense with the usual concentration upon art. The coming idea is actually taken from Max Weber. He characterized cultural modernity as a separation of the substantive reason expressed in religion and metaphysics into three autonomous spheres. They are science, morality, and art. These came to be differentiated because the unified worldviews of religion and metaphysics fell apart. Since the 18th century, the problems of inherited 
from these older worldviews could be arranged so as to fall under specific aspects of validity, truth, normative rightness, authenticity, and beauty. Scientific discourse, theories of morality, jurisprudence, and the production and criticism of art could in turn be institutionalized. Each domain of culture could be made to correspond to cultural professions in which problems could be dealt with as the concern of special experts. This professionalized treatment of the cultural tradition brings to the fore the intrinsic structures of each of the three dimensions of culture. There appear the structures of cognitive, instrumental, or moral practical, and of aesthetic expressive rationality, each of these under the control of specialists who seem more adept at being logical in these particular ways than other people are. As a result, the distance grows between the culture of the experts and that of the larger public. What accrues to culture through specialized treatment and reflection does not immediately and necessarily become the property of everyday praxis. With cultural rationalization of this sort, the threat increases that the life world, whose traditional substance has already been devalued, will become more and more impoverished. The project of modernity, formulated in the 18th century by the philosophers of the Enlightenment, consisted in the effort to develop objective science, universal morality, and law and autonomous art according to their inner logic. The Enlightenment philosophers want to utilize this accumulation of specialized culture for the enrichment of everyday life, that is to say, for the rational organization of everyday social life. Enlightenment thinkers of the cast of mind of Condorcet still had the extravagant expectation that the arts and sciences would promote not only the control of natural forces, but also understanding of the world and of the self moral progress, the justice of institutions, and even the happiness of human beings. The 20th century has shattered this optimism. The false programs of the negation of culture. In the history of modern art, one can detect a trend towards ever greater autonomy in the definition and practice of art. The category of beauty and the domain of beautiful objects were first constituted in the Renaissance. In the course of the 18th century, literature, the fine arts, and music were institutionalized as activities independent from sacred and courtly life. Finally, around the middle of the 19th century, an aestheticist conception of art emerged, which encouraged the artist to produce his work according to the distinct consciousness of art for art's sake. The autonomy of the aesthetic sphere could then become a deliberate project. But by the time of Baudelaire, a relation of opposites had come into being. Art had become a critical mirror, showing the irreconcilable nature of the aesthetic and the social worlds. This modernist transformation was all the more painfully realized. The more art alienated itself from the life and withdrew into the untouchableness of complete autonomy. The attempts to remove the distinction between artifact and the object of use, between conscious staging and spontaneous excitement, the attempts to declare everything to be art and everyone to be an artist, to retract all criteria and to equate aesthetic judgment with the expression of subjective experiences, all these undertakings have proved themselves to be sort of nonsense experiments. The radical attempt to negate art has ended up, ironically, by giving due exactly to these categories through which Enlightenment aesthetics had circumscribed its object domain. The Surrealists waged the most extreme warfare, but two mistakes in particular destroyed their revolt. The first one, when the containers of an autonomously developed cultural sphere are shattered, the contents get dispersed. The second mistake has more important consequences. Communication processes need a cultural tradition covering all spheres, 
cognitive, moral, practical, and expressive. A rationalized everyday life, therefore, could hardly be saved from cultural impoverishment through breaking open a single cultural sphere, art, and so providing access to just one of the specialized knowledge complexes. The surrealist revolt would have replaced only by abstraction. Alternatives. Instead of giving up modernity and its project as a lost cause, we should learn from the mistakes of those extravagant programs which have tried to negate modernity. Perhaps the types of reception of art may offer an example which at least indicates the direction of a way out. Bourgeois art had two expectations at once from its audiences. On the one hand, the layman who enjoyed art should educate himself to become an expert. On the other hand, he should also behave as a competent consumer who uses art and relates aesthetic experiences to his own life problems. The second and seemingly harmless manner of experiencing art has lost its radical implications exactly because it had a confused relation to the attitude of being expert and professional. In sum, the project of modernity has not yet been fulfilled. The project aims at a differentiated relinking of modern culture with everyday praxis that still depends on vital heritages but would be impoverished through mere traditionalism. Let me briefly distinguish the anti-modernism of the young conservatives from the pre-modernism of the old conservatives and from the post-modernism of the neo-conservatives. The young conservatives recapitulate the basic experience of aesthetic modernity. They claim as their own the revelations of a decentered subjectivity, emancipated from the imperatives of work and usefulness. And with this experience, they step outside the modern world. On the basis of modernistic attitudes, they justify an irreconcilable anti-modernism. The old conservatives do not allow themselves to be contaminated by cultural modernism. They observe the decline of substantive reason, the differentiation of science, morality and art, the modern worldview and its merely procedural rationality, with sadness and recommend a withdrawal to a position anterior to modernity. The neoconservatives welcome the development of modern science, as long as this only goes beyond its peer to carry forward technical progress, capitalist growth, and rational administration. Moreover, they recommend a politics of diffusing the explosive content of cultural modernity. Finally, Yuga Habermas says, I fear that the ideas of anti-modernity, together with an additional touch of pre-modernity, are becoming popular in the circles of alternative culture. Thank you for watching this video. If you like the video, please share and subscribe.